The following podcast is taken from a live broadcast on Inspire FM. Good evening and assalamu alaikum. This is Rihanna Fersal and you are listening to Inspire FM 105.1 FM um, being presented and delivered to you live from Luton and across the country. Uh, This evening we have a special for you, um, looking at the situation in Kashmir at the moment. Um, Many of you will know and hear about it, in Luton in particular. We've got a significant Kashmiri population and it's really ignited um, a concern amongst our community. Um, I know that I have had numerous discussions with people talking about their concerns for the people in Kashmir, for their families who live either in Kashmir or in or around the line of control um, at a situation that is grave and seems to be escalating. Um, For those of you who don't know, um, Kashmir was had a, had a certain amount of autonomy from its Indian st- from the Indian state through what was called Article 370. About four weeks ago, the Indian government decided to revoke Article 370, um, and essentially, and I, and I hope this is not biased, and I'm going to try and, and try and kind of deliver this in quite an objective way. Um, but essentially, Article 370 kind of governed um, India's role in the region. So essentially, it gave um, India some some very kind of minimal input into the area, but Kashmir was was. But for all sense, for all kind of important senses, self-governing. The revocation of Article 370 means that India and Kashmir is now being ruled directly from um, Delhi and from the Indian Parliament. What we know that happened straight after this was a significant increase in troops. Um, and actually, it's important to understand that the area already had was already was one of the most militarized zones in the world. Um, and we have heard lots and lots of very concerning things about what's happening there since. It's really been difficult to get an accurate picture. And why has it been difficult? It's been difficult because the people in Kashmir do not have internet access at the moment. Mobile phones are shut down. They are under curfew. So it's a real, real kind of difficult time for them. Um, But as I say, we've all been hearing and having discussions with people locally about what's happening. Um, I have with me in the studio co-presenting and contributing uh, Zafar Khan. Iqbal even, I'm not even sure the surname, is it Iqbal? Yes, yes. Does you can have... choose your own surname. Yes, I, I will do. It's, uh, Zafar Khan is a bit later on, so uh, uh, there's too, just too many Zafars uh, on, this, on this show, I think, unfortunately. Um, so, uh, yes, Jazakala had for, for the introduction. Uh, yes, I am co-hosting today as well, and welcome everybody. So today is, is a, a special two-hour session on Kashmir. We want to dissect the entire... Uh, Kashmir issue today to uh, to make the people aware. I guess Luton has a large Kashmiri uh, population or population who hail from Kashmir, so I'm sure this is of interest to them, and I'm sure they'll, they'll want to participate. Uh, so we've got a, a packed show today. We've got full spectrum of opinions uh, on this show today. We, we've got people from from the political sphere. We've got people from from I guess the human rights sphere. Uh, we've got correspondents uh, from various parts of the world talking about the, the situation. And we will have people from local organizations as well. So we're trying to give you a full full picture, a full view, a 360-degree view of what's happening, uh, inshallah. So we, we do have now actually uh, uh, somebody uh, who has actually uh, recently been to Kashmir and back. Uh, they've asked for their name to be kept uh, anonymous of, for obvious reasons. Uh, and uh, we, we can have a conversation with them, so perhaps they can give us a, a little bit of a background as well, as well as what, what Rehan has given, uh, and perhaps talk to them about the situation uh, on the ground. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Without, without sort of revealing, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm quite sort of, uh, uh, I can understand the reasons why you want to remain anonymous, uh, but perhaps if you can give us a context uh, into how you've had experience uh, in the Indian side of the Kashmir uh, and what you saw. Okay, uh, assalamu alaikum uh, and thank you for having me on the show. Sure. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a student, uh, I'm, 
I'm a student who's studying in uh, in New Delhi. I was home. I've uh, I was home uh, for this festival uh, Eid. Uh, so I went home on 3rd of August. I went a day prior to when the abrogation of Rule 30, uh, 370 uh, happened. Uh, so prior to going uh, back home, there was a lot of panic. There was a chaos. There was uh, there, 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 uh, there was uh, mobilization of military on large scale, which hasn't happened over the last uh, few years. Although uh, we have grown up uh, under like. A, Kashmir happens to be the most militarized zone in the world at this point of time, but uh, the whole mobilization of military from other states of India to uh, Kashmir was something uh, that created a lot of panic and chaos uh, among the people. Uh, uh, people started uh, stocking food, people started uh, stocking fuel, people started stocking medicines and it was really the build up to the whole event was something uh, that the Indian, uh, th that, that kind of added up, uh, up to the chaos. And there was no clarification, there was no clarity from the local administration over there that what was happening. So people there was a complete sense of panic. Uh, the, the, uh, so we happen to be one of the states where uh, independent uh, studies done by international humanitarian organizations fa have found PTSD and other anxiety-related diseases. So because of this chaos and uh, because of this mass mobilization of military, the anxiety and chaos among the Kashmiris was uh, kind of uh, building up. Uh, so when this day happened, uh, so when the whole abrogation happened, uh, prayer to that, the night prayer to that, the telephone lines, uh, internet, local TV networks, everything were uh, cut off. We had access to nothing. Literally, we were cut off uh, from the rest of the world on that very uh, morning. So people on that very day had no idea what is happening around. Uh, it was the, what what the what the Indian state had, uh, on that very day had done is like they given satellite phones to their top officials. Uh, so on that uh, very day, it was just the top officials who, who knew what was happening. Rest, 8 million people had no idea about that their fate was being decided uh, by uh, the parliament in uh, in Delhi. Uh, so coming back to, uh, to that uh, very day, so since then it has been a total communication uh, blackout in the whole of uh, valley. Eight million people have been incarcerated. Uh, there are uh, uh, people are not. I mean, uh, there are a little bit of ease in terms of restrictions, but people have been rest uh, mainly restricted to their uh, homes. Uh, at this point of time. Uh, there are reports which say that one million uh, soldiers are there uh, present in Kashmir, uh, which means that for every eight civilians that there is a, there is oh. one soldier. So, hello. Yeah, yeah, carry on. So, yes. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Carry on. Uh, yep. Yeah. Yeah, in, ter in, ter in terms of uh, in terms of uh, military presence, it's a heavily armed uh, zone at this point of uh, time. Uh, in, uh, what I felt uh, during those two weeks uh, of my stay in Kashmir is we literally have no idea about what is happening on in Kashmir because there is a total communication lockdown. Uh, the only the only news that is coming out of Valley is through word of mouth. So uh, we, we, we are back into uh, medieval uh, times where we are hearing something from someone. It's been passed on from one person. So t t tell us what what sort what sort of stories are you hearing? I I, I get that uh, you're not able to uh, to get uh, in yeah, communication. The, 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 yeah, the, the only the, the only stories that are coming out. So uh, we have to look at the geographic. Uh, I mean, we have to understand the geography of uh, Kashmir. And the the, uh, the the thing is the the me the media, particularly the international media, is projecting uh, Kashmir from a perspective of what is happening in. Srinagar. Uh, hmm. Srinagar forms a smaller part of uh, uh, smaller pa part of the whole of Kashmir. So the, a little bit of traffic on around uh, the famous Grand Lake is being projected as things are normal in Kashmir. We have no clarity on what is happening in south of Kashmir. We have no clarity on what is happening in uh, north of Kashmir uh, the, the, because of this communication uh, communication gap which is there at this point of 
time, uh, nothing is coming out of uh, Kashmir. Uh, very recently, BBC did a story. A doctor, uh, a doctor went to the press and place in Srinagar. He was not protesting. It was a humble request from his side that his patient should be allowed to have access uh, to healthcare. <laughs> he was detained by the police. It gives you an idea about the. Uh, the state of affairs in the state of Jammu and Kashmir at this point of time. Uh, there are reports around four to four to six thousand people have been arrested over the uh, over the last two weeks. And uh, to be honest, I mean, uh, I, I am not based in Kashmir. I'm I, I've been there for two weeks. I'm back in Delhi. It's really, uh, I mean, uh, it's really sad, uh, and we're really anxious over here. Okay. We, we, we okay. don't know what okay. is happening on on the ground. Can I, can I, 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 I'm not. Yeah. Sorry, just really wanted to ask you a quick question because I know that you said that you went. Salam I'm sorry. I know that you uh, said that you were in um, Kashmir when Article 370 was revoked. You, you've now travelled into um, back into India, into Delhi. How easy was that journey for you? How easy is it to leave for most people? Oh, okay. Uh, I, I give you the context. Uh, I, 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 I book. So uh, when I planned my travel to Delhi, it was like before uh, the, the things have started to get bad. Okay. So I had already booked my return tickets as well. So I was flying back. I was supposed to fly back on the day after Eid. That was for, that was 13th of August. So so going to the airport and getting your ticket cancelled because I was really worried about my parents and I didn't want yeah. to leave them back. Uh, uh, so I wanted to kind of postpone my uh, postpone my. Uh, Return. So, going to the airport, I went to the airport on the day of Eid just to change my ticket. I had to leave at 7 in the morning, had to cross not more than 50, I mean, would have easily crossed 50 checkpoints where you have to show your ID cards and convince them. Can that I just, I have can I just double check that number? Did you say 50, 50? Yeah, yeah, five zero fifty. 50. I live, I live in a part of a city where uh, the airport is. The airport is 22 kilometers away from my home, wow. so I had to cross. I had to cross 50 uh, checkpoints and explain to the uh, policemen and uh, the soldiers that I have a valid air ticket and I'm going to the airport. Uh, so it is. I mean, uh, because of these restrictions. People, I mean, uh, it's not just uh, whatever is uh, these restrictions there. It is the humiliation as well. Of because of these restrictions, there there is a sense of humiliation as well. Uh, you, uh, a policeman may understand that you're going to the airport, but 50 meters ahead you are again crossing another checkpoint, and the other cop may not understand what you're going for. So it is it it's a constant struggle for us. So. Uh, anyway, cutting this long story short, then I somehow managed to reach the airport, got my ticket cancelled, and came back home. And coming back home was equally difficult for me. I was flying. Uh, I, I came back on a Sunday. Then later on, uh, I was supposed to fly on a flight which flies at 12:30. Uh, 12:30. I left my place at five in the morning. So I had to leave at a time when there are a little uh, when when the security presence is little. So in terms in terms of uh, security presence, yes, it it was a little difficult for us. It's really very difficult for people to reach the airport. Uh, two weeks back, it was really difficult. People had to kind of leave quite uh, early in the morning. What we are hearing on the news at this point of time is there are. I mean, the state administration is coming up uh, saying that we have uh, the, there is a little bit of ease of access. People are able to kind of go to the airports. There is, they say that we have restored landlines. Landline phones are these lines. Uh, like there, there are lines which uh, which people like not everyone in Kashmir has a lease line. Mm -hmm. So they have restored only 10% of these lines in Kashmir and it is uh, really difficult for people to communicate. I, I would give you an example. I haven't spoken to my mother for 16 days. My father, two months back, my father had a, a cardiac arrest and he had a, he needed a immediate stent. His medicine, uh, his, his also, uh, he's also on a medicine which is not easily available in Kashmir and we had to kind of uh, organize it from different suppliers and dealers. The problem because of this communication gang, we have not been able to reach to that uh, pharmacy or the person who organizes that medicine. So over the last 
uh, over the last 16 days i received a call from uh, my mother this morning it was a brief call it was a one minute call she had to travel 15 kilometers uh, to a place where apparently the lease lines are working and literally wait for 30 minutes for her turn and she made a one minute call to tell me that they are fine and please send your father's medicine mm. this can give you an example what sure. we are we are going sure. through. That, okay. that's, that's literally, quite literally i mean that's quite sad to hear. So, so what, what I'm hearing is difficulty in travel, humiliation, a kind of a humiliating way, what, you know, way of sort of being dealt with, difficulty in accessing medical yeah. medicine, medical supplies, and just just to extend a little bit on that because I know a lot of people have been saying is that what can people in Kashmir do? Um, they're, they're they're trapped there, and there's been talk of maybe crossing over to the border into Pakistan. How easy would that be? See, see, I, I'll give, I'll, I'll give you the, I'll give, I'll give you a different context. Let's, let's, let's for a second forget uh, what uh, the people are fighting for or what their aspirations yeah, yeah. are, be it wrong or be it right. But n nothing in this world justifies this siege no. at this point of time. No. I, I mean, I don't understand. I don't understand what is what what, what are eight million people being punished for. Uh, they, they're not, I mean, uh, no one knows, uh, irrespective of whether they're happy with this decision or not, but people are being punished, and they're being punished really badly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in coming, to, coming to your question, the, the thing is, there are people, I mean, um, let, let's not look at the context uh, of uh, the pa Pakistan. Let, let's ki kind of uh, keep Pakistan away from this discussion at this uh, point of time. The problem, the problem, the problem is like if Kashmiris start speaking about uh, Pakistan, they're always labeled. There is a label uh, yeah, for them. No, so let's keep Pakistan yeah. away from this. Yeah, let's uh, let's let's keep them away. So the the point is, it is um, w w what I feel sad about is. Uh, there, there is a lot of solidarity in India. Uh, people, uh, uh, people who understand uh, uh, conflicts, people who understand, uh, who, who, who don't support uh, the hyper nationalist ideology in India, they kind of uh, have a lot of solidarity with, uh, with, with the people. And but the problem is, but the problem is, uh, they're not being able to kind of uh, wise that, wise that out. Uh, in terms of in terms of medical supplies and other things, uh, uh, there are people. So what I've done is like I have kind of uh, uh, I, I don't know like uh, I, and I'm not a person. Uh, I kind of managed to find someone who's flying. Uh, I don't know that person. He's flying to another area. I, I managed to give him my medicine, and I'm I don't know if uh, those medicines would reach my father or not. But okay. because of the community, that is. What so, uh, can, can I just can, can I just just ask that that I mean you you've described the the current situation, um, and and what would be the the quote unquote norm uh, if you were back home on, under norm conditions? Uh, uh, what's this, that situation like? Just to give the, our listeners a, a broader perspective. See, uh, you 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 have to. I, I'll be honest. Like I've. I've, I've, I've been in Kashmir for 25 years. I've grown up. Uh, I've, I've seen everything. Mm. So, what is what is abnormal for the world has become normal for us. Sure. I'll, I'll be honest. Uh, these curfews, these restrictions, somewhere have started to. I mean, for the people in Kashmir, th th this is this is the new normal in Kashmir. Uh, the the, uh, the people people dying, people being uh, kind of uh, uh, the, the everyday violence uh, is. A new normal for us. The, the, the problem is the, the, pro, the problem is like it has been a long-standing issue. Uh, I, I think it's high time. I mean, uh, everyone in Kashmir is tired, and like we, have, we we've, there is a lot of fatigue now. Three decades of this conflict, uh, we've lost over 100,000 people in this conflict. Uh, hundreds and thousands are. Uh, I mean, thousands are in uh, jail. We have like mass. We have, we have uh, half widows. We have we have children in jails. So the problem. So the problem is people are really tired and sick. No one really knows what the mood is in Kashmir because Kashmir is completely under a lockdown at this point of time. Uh, every voice, every every sort of dissent at this point of time is crushed. Uh, you, you, uh, BBC did a story on a doctor trying to re request the administration on the access to health care. Uh, that doctor was detained.
I mean, I'm I'm saying it again because it gives you a sense, it gives you an idea what is happening. I mean, mm. uh, the op the, op the, the opposition party the leaders, leaders yeah. the opposition party leaders flew to Srinagar and, and they were turned back. So that can that gives you another perspective, yeah. I guess. Yeah, uh, ex exactly. I mean, look at look at the mainstream Indian uh, parties. I mean, they have been there have been a constant support for India in Kashmir, irrespective of how the situation in India has been. They've been the true representatives of India. They are under they've been arrested. Your your three former chief ministers are under detention. It should give you a sense of. Uh, I mean, obviously, it speaks volumes about. Uh, what is happening there? The, the current so the administration in Kashmir is run by the governor at this point of time. So he says that we're completely fine with whatever is happening. Uh, normalcy, it, it will take some time to get back uh, things to normal. So the, the, the problem, the problem is like at this point of time, they're not worried about. I mean, uh, it's it's really very easy for them to put people under lockdown, but they, they're not thinking about that it could lead to a it could lead to lead to a bigger crisis so we have we have cases yeah we have we have cases where hospitals have seen decline in surgeries because patients are not reaching to the hospitals we have cases where doctors are not able to kind of speak to other doctors in other tertiary care hospitals and check on them uh, what is happening so the, the problem is the again the, uh, the other aspect of this crisis could be a big mental health crisis I mean, you have people under lockdown. It has an impact on the uh, uh, the mental. I mean, it has an impact on the mental health. It has uh, an impact on the well-being of the people. You had an international humanitarian organization doing a report on Kashmir, saying that 45% of your population suffers from PTSD. That because of this long-standing conflict. Can, can I just and really, really quickly, because we're running out of time, but I th just wanted to give people, um, as you say, I think we want to build a, a real picture of the context in which, of what's happening in Kashmir, but the context in which it's happening. Um, there's been much talk about the current government in India, um, uh, led by Narendra Modi and his ideology. Can you give me a little bit, and I think we've only got about 30 seconds or so, but can you just give me a little bit of a picture of what it's like for Muslims, not in Kashmir, because obviously you know, that, you know, that's something that we can um, talk about a bit later on, but in terms of in India, where um, Muslims are already living, what's, what's life like for Muslims in India at the moment under this particular government? <coughs> See, I, I, I'll just I'll just give you an uh, idea. A few a few years back, a man was lynched lynched by a few people on uh, on accusations of that he was carrying cattle. The, the, the Supreme Court of India just uh, uh, I mean, ex so they found the, there is a video evidence. A news channel reported it. They they played the video where. Uh, there are nine men who killed that person accepted on TV that yes we killed that man but uh, the courts and like the governments are defending people like them so I think it's really difficult it's, it's how, not, how, it's how not, safe uh, do you, how uh, safe do you feel as a Muslim in India I mean, it's, uh, I I I not I not put it like how safe Muslims are in India I mean the top I mean even even uh, even the other religious even the majority religion, religion, that is the Hindus, they started. I mean, uh, people who are thinking on progressive lines, even uh, people who are who are associated with uh, other uh, Indian parties, they started feeling a little unsafe because because you have uh, you have this jingoistic and hyper national. Yeah. I mean, the, there is rise of hyper nationalism, which is really problematic for. Which is not problematic for Muslims. I think that which is problematic for other. Uh, minorities and even uh, other liberal uh, liberal and progressive thinking uh, Hindus as well. I think that is the pro problem. The rise of higher nationalism is a bigger problem for everyone in uh, India at this point. Of time. Okay, we thank you very much for speaking to us. We understand how difficult it is. Really appreciate it if, you'd, if you could keep in touch with us and keep us um, kind of alert of what's happening and what you're hearing coming out of the region. But thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening. Th th thank you, thank you so much. I would really appreciate that if you pray for all of us. Well, Your prayers are really needed. Inshallah, inshallah. inshallah. Sure. And now joining us in the studio, this is why I'm having difficulties, because I'm a little bit under the weather, a little bit under the weather, um, and we're, I've been joined by a plethora of Zafars today. So um, <laughs> I've already introduced you to co-host Zafar Iqbal. I've got the right Zafar, yes. Uh, and we've been now joined in the studio by Zafar Goreshi, many of you will know. He's the chairman of the... Um,
Kashmir Kashmir campaign global. Um, Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikumsalam. And Jazakallah khair for joining us. Um, any any comments on on our previous um, caller? Uh, mashallah, the brother very eloquently kind of described the current situation, <clears throat> and that's happening in Kashmir. Um, unfortunately, uh, to be honest, I don't think um, there are enough words in the dictionary to describe what's going on in Kashmir at this point. Um, the pain, the suffering that our brothers and sisters are facing uh, under the illegal occupa- Indian occupation. It's very, very hard to describe them in the words, but inshallah, um, I see we're coming down to the break. Yeah, so so we've we got a, a short break that we, we're yeah. counting down to. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure we can pick up, but uh, briefly, if you could say, I think you, you are from that part of the world, so you know firsthand. Absolutely, Alhamdulillah. I was born and uh, brought up in the Indian-occupied Kashmir. Um, you know, um, it's where I came from, and I'm proud to be uh, coming from that land. I've been here for the last 20 years, but I go back and my whole family is in Indian occupied Kashmir. My uncles, my brothers, like, you know, we have about a thousand families, you know, not all of families are in Kashmir. Um, so yeah. we, we, I think we'll, we'll get a, a, a <clears throat> perspective of life there from yourself as well, from your experiences, past and present, inshallah. But for now, we're going to take a short break. Uh, we'll be right back. Please stay tuned. This is going to be a fantastic hour. If you want to know anything and everything about Kashmir, stay tuned, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. This is Atif Nawaz, and you're listening to an Inspire FM podcast. Welcome, welcome back. You're listening to Inspire FM 105.1 FM, broadcasting live from Luton uh, and through the internet and social media globally, inshallah. So we're talking about Kashmir. It's a Kashmir special show. We're doing a two-hour show to give us uh, a complete 360 degrees on Kashmir, its history, its culture, what's happening at the moment, uh, why we're talking about it, and and what needs to be done uh, to make the situation better. So before the break, we were talking to somebody uh, who hails from uh, the Indian side of of Kashmir, uh, who basically managed to escape uh, to Delhi where he's studying, and he was giving his view views on how difficult it was to actually try to sort of get away from uh, from his homeland, effectively, uh, where where he's from, and the difficulties he's faced. Uh, We're going to carry on, uh, I guess, trying to build that picture uh, shortly, inshallah, we're trying to get hold of somebody who's who's, uh, who's based in India, who's a uh, who's a director of Human Rights Watch. Uh, but what we'll do, uh, perhaps, Zafar uh, Qureshi uh, Saab, perhaps you started talking about um, Kashmir because that's where you were born, that's where you come from. Uh, perhaps you can carry on and, and build a picture of of what life is like there, what it was before, and what it is now. Jazakallah uh, Kashmir, as you know, has been in turmoil for the last in conflict for the last thirty odd years. Right. right. Um, in terms of the Kashmir issue, it's been going on uh, since nineteen forty-seven, and ever since then, uh, the human rights of Kashmiri people uh, have been snatched away by the Indian Army. Hmm. Uh, initially, under the pretext of instrument of accession, um, the Indian government started building the. Uh, bringing in the forces into Kashmir, who slowly started curbing the democratic rights of every individual. In the last 30 years, these human rights violations, killings, molestation, rape, (coughs) they've been on increase every day and every day. Just in the last 30 years, the official figure that we have from some of the well-known organizations like Amnesty International, which estimates over 70,000 people uh, have been martyred, but within the valley, uh, the well-known figure is well over 100,000 people have been martyred. And these are innocent civilians who, uh, you know, India claims on the um, international media that these are terrorists. But no, these are the innocent civilians who go um, by their lives every day. So imagine 100,000 people in the last mm, sure. 30 years. That's 10 people being killed sure. every day. Sure. Yeah? Uh, with the presence of over a million armed forces um, occupying the land, um, just big enough as England, there is not even a uh, breathing uh, space for people to free, breathe freely. Imagine. So uh, I, I guess, I mean, you've described Kashmir from, from I guess, your perspective, mm-hmm. uh, and, and Sister Rihanna. Um, now, th- there are 100,000 deaths, as you said, and they've been documented, as you suggested. There have been documentaries. 
aired where women have been systematically systematically Abused. raped yeah. uh, by the security forces. Uh, but the ordinary person will ask, why? Well, why? Why is this thing happening? What's the cause of it? You know, what's the, uh, you know, what's what's the uh, what's the reason? So. Um it's a very good question, and I think we need to kind of go back into the history when India and Pakistan um, were formed. Um, so when India was uh, kind of left by the British Army, Pakistan um, fought for its freedom and gained its freedom. The princely states that existed around in the Asian subcontinent were given a choice uh, by the British uh, government to accede either to one of the dominions or uh, some of the princely states, like the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, uh, uh, Junagad, or Hyderabad, they were given an additional choice to stay independent should they wish. Mm. The Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir uh, wanted to stay independent, and he uh, signed a standstill, uh, standstill agreement uh, with uh, Pakistan, but India kind of uh, refused, delayed Stand, uh, the standstill agreement. The principle on which the partition took place or the accession of these um, took place, when you look at the Junagad, the idea was it would be the Maharaja or the ruling party that would actually choose whether they want to choose uh, exit to either of the dominions. Now, Junagad had uh, a Muslim king who naturally wanted to accede to Pakistan and he actually did sign an instrument of accession with Pakistan. However, the people of Junagad in majority were non-Muslims mm. and India made a whole huge cry about it, um, stating that actually it's the people who need to make that choice because it's there now, you know, we're free, we're democratic, it's the people who should be making the choice. Because Maharaja had already signed an instrument of accession with Pakistan and there were a lot of uh, appealing in uh, Junagad, India actually sent down the forces to the Junagad and occupied and integrated Junagad forcefully into India. Right, okay, so, uh, so, so I think we want to carry on that discussion. Yeah. I know it's, it's leading somewhere. I, we do have uh, uh, Minakshi and Safura Telly uh, on the call. Uh, perhaps uh, perhaps if uh, if we have a discussion perhaps with Min, uh, Minashki, who, who's the South Asian Director for Human Rights Watch. Watch. Uh, um, <coughs> Minakshi, uh, hi, it's, it's Rihana Faisal. I'm co-hosting this evening with um, Zafar um, Iqbal. Thank you very much for joining us. Can you hear us? <coughs> Good afternoon. Yes, I can. Good afternoon. Okay, that's great. We've, ha we've, we've spoken to somebody earlier on, I don't know if you managed to hear, who was in Kashmir at the time um, that Article 370 was revoked, and he's spoken a little bit about how people were feeling there and given us a little bit of a picture of what's been happening um, in, in Kashmir pre-revocation um, pre of the article and since um, through the limited contact that he has had with family members. Um, as a human rights organisation, can you give us, um, expand on that? a little bit for us you know what's it what's the situation in Kashmir and how do you feel um, about the situation in terms of the impact on the individual human rights of Kashmiris um, thank you I am afraid I didn't hear your spe previous speaker so uh, but uh, in terms of what's uh, what we are documenting right now and what we are speaking about right now, we are. Uh, this is the third week uh, since uh, the decision uh, the, uh, to, to alter the constitutional status, and uh, there is a continued lo lockdown on on all forms of telecommunications, the internet or the phones, and it is causing um, an enormous disruption in uh, in lives of ordinary Kashmiris. Uh, there is also uh, there are also restrictions on movement. Uh, even though uh, there are uh, the, the, curf the curfew orders or there is uh, sort of uh, are lifted during the day, so there are nighttime restrictions. In, in in actual effect, what is happening is that there are checkpoints, repeated checkpoints. There is no public transportation. People are also worried about about getting out of their homes, so people are largely restrained uh, within their restricted to the neighbourhoods. Um, uh, we spoke with people who have not been able to communicate with their family members, uh, who, who are extremely worried about each other. Uh, there are concerns about uh, just the day-to-day -day practicalities of, of uh, running businesses. This is, uh, you know, just because in, the, in, in a digital age, people communicate on, on the Internet. They send emails to each other about bookings, about uh, placing orders, about receiving orders. Uh, filing their taxes, anything, and all of this is is at a standstill right now. 
Uh, we're, we're hearing multiple reports, and again, you know, it's very difficult, as you say, because of the uh, the way that the communications have been manipulated in the area. But we're hearing reports. Um, I think the BBC had something out either yesterday or the day before um, about allegations of uh, torture. How how realistic do you think that those reports are? Well, um, in in the subcontinent, uh, custodial torture is a har is a harsh truth. So in in in, if, in 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 the fact that people have made these allegations, it is perfectly possible that this could have happened because this is something that we hear in police stations across the region. Um, we are also hearing uh, in Kashmir of other det of of uh, detentions, of prevented yes. detentions in the hundreds, in the thousands, um, and. Uh, we have been repeatedly saying to the Indian authorities that they must release names of people, uh, make sure that the families know where their where their relatives are, um, ensure that they have legal counsel so they can challenge their detentions. Um, we have not as yet had any uh, response from the authorities except to say that all of these preventive detentions are occurring within uh, respective police stations. So it's the local authorities who are making these decisions. So in terms of what's happening recently, I know that we've, we've got quite limited information about that. But I know Human Rights Watch um, has done work in the region before. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about some of the evidence that you've gathered um, in the area? I mean, prior to this unprecedented move and kind of escalation of, of tensions in the area, or the most recent escalation, what kind of things have you documented were happening um, in Kashmir, um, in terms, again, in terms of the human rights of Kashmiris? Well, um, since the late 1980s, there's been a there's been a, a, a movement, a separatist movement, that has been that has uh, that started up, linked to um, a rigged election and, and and young Kashmiris who were unhappy with the outcome. And um, since then, the security forces have been cracking down, not just on on armed groups. Um, uh, but also uh, on 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 peaceful protesters. There have been we've documented cases where peaceful protesters um, in the in the 90s uh, uh, were shot while they were protesting. Um, in terms of the uh, the insurgency side of things, unfortunately, uh, even there are in any conflict situation there is almost always um, abuses by all parties concer concerned. Civilians get caught in the middle. It's yeah. uh, it's something that we. Um, have been have been flagging for a long time that you know for for, for Kashmiris um, and especially the young men for instance now who are being who are um, being accused of throwing stones or people young men who do throw stones um, you know these are these are people that have grown up only in conflict that's all they have seen they have they have witnessed uh, you know uh, violence uh, from the from the time they were born and and that creates its own dynamic and its own own challenges. There has been no attempt whatsoever to try and um, reach out and create uh, an environment where there can be any kind of dialogue. Um, there is a lot of anger among the young the younger Kashmiris. Um, they, they feel that they've not been heard uh, when they when when and and in, there is a huge military presence, which means that on a day to day basis, and it is something people often don't understand. That and I often try to draw the example of, of the annoyance people feel when they're standing in a security line at airports, and it goes on and on and on and on, and something beeps, and people get irritated. And that is usually the life of anyone living in a conflict area. They're stopped. They can be stopped at any time. They can be asked for ID. They can be asked questions. They can be treated with suspicion, and and that is an environment. Which which is uh, which fuels uh, frustration and anger. Of course, I was speaking um, to an individual actually. I think a couple of days after the the revocation of Article 370 by the Indian government, and what he said to me at the time was that actually we have a a real fear of an imminent genocide here. Now that that sounds when you know to, to hear it, it sounds. Um, you know, it it sounds quite dramatic. But do you think do you think those those fears that that young man expressed to me? Do you think those are that they have, they have any truth in them? That, that there's any kind of um, you know, is there any is there any valid validation to those fears? Well, uh, you know, the thing is, genocide is a technical term. Yes. It's a it's a term that is that is determined by by experts. Um, 
so so yes it it becomes enters into into normal uh languaging because people want to express their anxiety um but uh, yes i mean you know are, do they have reason to be anxious of course they do once these restrictions lift we don't quite know how how things will work out uh, uh we we are extremely concerned about about the sort of rhetoric that is playing out uh which is so uh, driven by people that are pro pakistan or people that they that are pro india and want to back their particular governments and yet what we would like to see is a much more robust uh defense of civil liberties of, of the rights course. of kashmiris yeah. and so, and and certainly. their human rights <clears throat> certainly and you know particularly as we know there's a there's a un resolution which supports the kashmiri right to self determination which many of us say including myself i don't mind saying um support um I mean actually just a, a final question from from me um in terms of what's happening in india and the and the decision by the indian government at the moment what do you think is the purpose post making the decision and we saw the escalation of military presence and we've seen the escalation in terms of limiting communication from the area what's the purpose of the indian government making that decision at this time and shutting down communication in this way why are they doing it well the the indian authorities have said that as compared to previous uh, challenging situations uh, where there have been outbreaks of violence in this particular case there has the, these preventions and these restrictions have in fact saved lives because because there have not been anyone killed due to the protests and certainly no one killed in the security forces retaliation um against these violent protests so, so, so that if, if that... the indian government insists that they uh, that that their their decision has saved lives so essentially uh, the question what... is under international law uh, is is a question of, pro- of of being proportionate and does it mean that people should be locked up effectively mm. and, in, and, and, in, and also and, and, also, these... and also the thing that strikes me is that the government knew that when they do, did this it would be something that the that, that significant sort of a, a significant number of the populace wouldn't be pleased with as a result that there would be some kind of response possibly um kind of protest and that kind of thing and in order to kind of quell that expression um of their disagreement they've put these steps into place certainly the 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 right of kashmiris to express their view on on this is is being denied to them because they have no medium to do so uh, uh the the and 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 the government should have uh, should should have been better prepared in a way i would say, you know because the thing is that any any such decision because kashmir has this mixed population it's a muslim majority state with with a large number of hindus and a large number of buddhists yeah. and and to constantly decide that oh well the people in jammu were very happy because because or or the people in ladakh are very happy and therefore it's only the valley that is that might have discontent is 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 wrong because it is it is kashmir is the whole whose whose fate are being determined and they have had no voice their leaders are all locked up there there there, there is no way there has been no sort of consultation of any sort and this this and this fact that they are not being able to even speak up or 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 discuss how they feel about it is extremely uh, is extremely unfortunate uh, sorry it's, it's stuff I'm, I'm co-hosting as well so I, i guess if if that's the government line the fact that they're they're doing it for safety and security uh what's their line uh in trying to explain the fact that the opposition party leaders uh were denied entry into into kashmir um the 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 fact is that this is uh, one of the one, one one of the challenges is what is defined as normalcy right. and uh you know the, the, in in the in 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 much of the uh, much of the media there is often this this description of the situation in kashmir as normal now what is considered normal for 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 a, for anyone that believes in in universal human rights the right to life should also come with the with with the right to free speech and the right to liberty and all of those other rights are being curtailed sure. um and and the and and we do worry about about the upholding of all human rights for kashmiris
Okay, uh, uh, um, Inakshi, thank you very much for your contribution. It's, it's been fascinating to get a view from somebody who's close up, uh, somebody who's involved in human rights, and and uh, and and Minakshi, your director of the Human Rights Watch, speaking to us today on Inspire FM to give us your view on, on the situation in Kashmir. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Uh, we also have uh, Safura Teli, uh, who uh, is a British Kashmiri uh, and who's been involved, uh, I guess, in the legal pro pro profession side of things. Safura, so uh, and thank you very much for uh, holding on. I know you've been waiting patiently. Uh, perhaps you can give us a view on on your experiences and, and uh, what your views are on, on the situation in Kashmir. Uh, Walaikum salam um, Thank you very much for, for inviting me and thank you just for having this wider conversation. Um, just when Minakshi was talking, I, I really just felt heartened that actually in India there are people that are actually working in the interests of the Kashmiris and that they have a very balanced, sensible commitment to, to finding out the truth. Um, that's not something that really you see a lot of um, in India, primarily because it's a country that... Um, has a very crude approach to Kashmir, as you, you know, people are starting to understand um, propaganda, like jingoistic terminology, like nationalistic language, is something that completely trumps. Are, are you are you, are you from from the Indian side of Kashmir, or which side of Kashmir are you? Um, I am. Yes, I am. I'm okay, and, and and you speak of the you speak of these terms from experience, or uh, it, it's, it's yeah. Okay. It, it, cause, yeah, I think I think if you talk to anyone who's from the Indian side of Kashmir, whether they were born there or born outside, I mean, I was I wasn't born in Kashmir, but all of my extended family are there. I have a very close connection. I visit often. Sure. Um, so if you talk to anybody who's grown up with the, um, the, the 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 beauty, but the paradoxical beauty of Kashmir over them, um, they all of them will have some sort of traumatic experience. You can't you can't talk about Kashmir without talking about the reality of the situation on the ground. You know. As mm. children, seeing the military in the street, going to the corner shop, and there's, there's military everywhere. It's just such an inherent part of your of your understanding of what Kashmir is. It, it equates to militarized zone. Um, and that's just my experience as someone who visited, not even as someone that lived there. Mm. Um, but in terms of when you were saying um, my, my, the language I was using regarding India, um, because Kashmir is such a massive part of my identity and my psyche, um, you know, I've, I've been involved in sort of campaign work we got on Kashmir, um, and the issue that I've always been confronted with is the lack of sort of um, documentation and information, tangible information um, that can be um, effectively used to support and to be able to, to help people understand the situation in Kashmir. And I think the reason for that, one of the main reasons for that is India, and I say that in terms of the government, the, the political um, entity, India's political entity, um, they, they just don't engage with sophisticated, um, meaningful discussion on the issue of Kashmir. Even talking to fellow students when I was at university or other Indians I've met, um, you know, a very small portion of them are very willing and open to, to listen to, you, mm. to my perspective as Kashmiri and have a conversation. But so many of them are just, they, they can't get their heads around the fact that but Kashmir is the crown of India, you know? It's, it's all rhetoric. It's, it's, there's no, there's not even a, 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 there's no real space for a meaningful conversation on the basis of. And, and that, that's that's generally true of all India. You're saying, is it all your experience of India? I'm just my experience of, of Indians. I mean, it, it, it's just, and I don't mean to, um, to 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 at all conflate Indians with the current government sure, um, at sure. all. You know, they, they do very different things. But even my experience of Indian friends, um, Kashmir is not a topic that I like to bring up because it does bring up very strong. Um, nationalistic ideas and just a reluctance on their part to, to acknowledge that their country that they're so proud of that is the biggest democracy and so on has been complicit and actually has been responsible for up to around maybe over 100,000 deaths, mm. um, 8,000, 10,000 disappearances. I mean, I don't know if you're aware if it was mentioned earlier in the program, but today is actually the International Day of the Disappeared. Mm. And that's an international thing. It's something to commemorate and force disappearances across the world. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in the valley, there has been um, you know between eight to ten thousand um, disappeared individuals, um, and actually, there's also been two to four thousand unmarked graves that have been found. Okay, so, so let, let me let me bring in yeah. uh, just just stay there for, uh, for a minute, uh, sure. Sfura. I just want to bring in uh, Zafar Greshi again. Uh, so uh, we will pick up the, the historical uh, the the historical sort of context we started off with, but I just wanted to contrast your experience with uh, with Zafura's. Do you concur the fact that when you speak to ordinary Indians, uh, they have this closed mind about Kashmir, and, and you know you can't debate about it, you can't discuss it. And, and or, or is there um, is is was was Minakshi uh, Minakshi in minority? That's what I'm trying to get at. 
Um, to be honest, I think uh, what Sister Sephora is actually saying is quite a majority in that I've, I was born in Kashmir, I've grown up there. I've studied in, in an Indian school mm-hmm. full of Indians and that's the reaction you will actually get. It's kind of seen as sort of a crown of India. They don't want to talk about it. It's a very nationalistic uh, issue. Mm-hmm. Even here, um, I'm in touch with the people from India itself. But when it comes to Kashmir, uh, that's an issue where they don't want to talk. I think it's all these feelings that start coming out about nationalism, patriotism. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though they do acknowledge, yes, a lot of human rights violations have taken place. But for them, it's a jingoism between all Kashmir is an issue between India and Pakistan. So right. it's a Pakistan is viewed through Absol- the Pakistan lens of Pakistan lenses then. rather than actually the Kashmir lenses, uh, you know, the Kashmir himself. What's happening in Kashmir? What do the people of Kashmir want? Um, so yes, it does uh, bring out quite a lot of uh, nationalism. And, and this this is historic, or this is just recent in your eye? Um, to be honest, I think it's always been historical. I do remember even before the conflict started in 1986, 87, right? The, um, India was, uh, you know, we have had three, four wars, uh, mm. three wars between India and Pakistan on Kashmir. So it's not just been recent, it's always been there. But now it's becoming more evident with the BJP government, uh, the fascist sure. uh, Hindu government that's in place. And, you know, they're sort of uh, freely and openly declaring a war on the people of Kashmir. Yes, uh, they've actually sort of sidestepped any of the quote unquote moderate sort of uh, supportive it's politicians as well they'd be locked up too absolutely hmm. uh, so you know yeah it's surfacing more it's more visible now but I think the feelings have always been there right okay we've got a minute or so so uh, Rihanna you'll pick up again I, I do have a tendency to sort of uh, uh, carry on so. no, no, we appreciate that tendency I, I, missed, <laughs> I mean I, it struck me when I was a, a Sephora Islam to it's Rihanna um, oh, but it was struck me when you were speaking there actually because I think Talking about Kashmir generally, I think is a challenge. And, and I'll probably ask the question, give you a bit of time to think about it over the break, because it feels to me that when I speak to people about Kashmir, whether it's um, from, from, from outside of the Pakistani Indian community, it seems to be an issue that nobody really understands or is aware of. And if you contrast it with knowledge around issues like the Palestine issue, which is sort of similar in, in some ways, yeah. and the amount of knowledge that there is about that, and with Kashmir, what, why, what's the gap? What is our gap? Why has the Kashmir issue not been able to reach that level of international kind of consciousness? Uh, and, and as I thought, you have to answer that after this short break. So listen, That's stay tuned. Time for you. S- stay tuned. We're going to be back after this short break. You're listening to an Inspire FM podcast, making available our popular programs from our daily broadcast on Inspire FM. Assalamu alaikum, listeners, and welcome back to Inspire 105.1 FM. We are broadcasting uh, live tonight from Luton, talking about the really important issue of Kashmir and what is happening um, in Kashmir. Um, as I said right at the beginning, uh, a few weeks ago now, the Indian Parliament unilaterally decided to um, abrogate Article 370 of their constitution, which gave Kashmir a certain amount of autonomy from the Indian state, bound in with with, with that um, that piece of legislation, was the right of the Kashmiri people for self determination, which was um, a UN resolution um, that the Kashmiri people should decide their own future and should decide how they govern themselves. So are they an independent state or do they decide to go with one of the um, other two existing countries? Kashmiri people to date have not had that right of self-determination. Instead, as I say, uh, India unilaterally, so that's by themselves, decided to get rid of this bit of legislation um, and are now governing Kashmir directly from India. We've talked a little bit about the impact of that decision on the people of Kashmir. Um, what what India did immediately after making that decision in terms of cutting down um, communication and the the additional troops and the additional curfews. I use the word additional because this is already a heavily militarized zone. It's already um, an area where the normal is quite abnormal. 
where people are already living in quite restrictive circumstances. Um, so we, we've heard sort of from individual personal testimonies and also from human rights organisations. We still have, um, thankfully, Safura has agreed to stay online with us. We still have Safura Thili on the phone with us. Safura is a, a British Kashmiri with family still in Kashmir. Um, Safura, uh, thank you for agreeing to stay on the line with us. Um, You're welcome. Just before we close off um, um, before the break, I sort of asked the question and, and said, you know, we'll have the break of some uh, reflection time, is why is it, do you think, or do you even agree with me, actually, that we've not managed to um, make the Kashmir issue something that sits in every kind of human conscious that has an international sort of, um, you know, understanding and international recognition? Um, yeah, this is something that when I was younger used to really frustrate me, used to really make me just angry. I couldn't understand why, um, when you look at the facts and figures, people weren't recognising or mentioning or understanding that the situation that Kashmir is in. Um, but as I got older, I realised, first of all, it's not a competition about how many people have died. Um, you know, more people have died in Kashmir than in Palestine. That's not, that's not the point. Yeah. And because I also recognised um, that there's a pattern emerging, and that pattern is that when there are conflicts in the world, um, and this is not anyone's fault in particular, it's just the nature of um, the kind of global Muslim psyche, I think. Um, the pattern was that uh, um, often non-Arab kind of conflicts just don't get the exposure, they don't get the same kind of traction um, that others do. And I don't think that's a controversial thing to say, I think it's just, you know, the way it's been. Um, I think it's less so the case now, especially with the advent of social media. I think people um, from all different kind of um, whole plurality of kind of ethnic backgrounds, um, Muslims are more able to access information and share that information, which is why there are more effective campaigns for um, looking at the plight of Muslims in Rohingya, um, Rohingya Muslims and in Central African Republic. Yeah. Um, but I think there are a variety of reasons um, why the Kashmir issue hasn't sort of been highlighted to the same extent. Um, and I think, well, just to sort of run, like briefly mention a few, um, I think first of all, there's a smaller diaspora of Kashmiris that have left Indian Valley of Kashmir, um, who would really be well equipped to, to, to speak about this, this struggle. There is definitely very dedicated communities in the UK and groups of people across Europe that have tried really hard to do that, but the, the volume is just not there in terms of the numbers. Yeah. Um, a lot of people that did leave Kashmir, they left as sort of working professionals, so they came they came to other countries, they settled down, they focused on their jobs, um, educating their children, etc., etc. They didn't really want to or feel like they were able to talk about the political situation. Um, I think also uh, um, India, um, the clout that they have internationally means that it's not really a scenario whereby people feel that challenging India will lead to something. And actually, they so don't when, when you use the word India. clout, um, what, 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 what do you mean in I'm, terms of clout? I mean, the um, sort of political significance. You know, it, it's a lot easier for the UK to criticise. Um, you know, make a statement on, on the Central African Republic where yeah. I'm talking that's kind of from an ignorant point of view because I don't actually know what, you know, if there are any relevant trade agreements and so on. But so um, economic in terms clout. Of, yes, basically economic clout in terms of, um, and that's been growing over the years. Um, and it's definitely a point now whereby, um, you know, the same with Saudi Arabia, another good obvious example, um, whereby Western leaders and British political leaders, they really don't want to say something. And actually they probably realise that if they do say something, um, it's not going to have an impact at all. A few years ago, I think it was um, one of the Miliband, sorry, I can't remember which, um, but basically he was told when he went to India to not David, mention the K-word. David Miliband. David. David. Was it David? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so it was to not mention the K-word, you know, and, and even though that is absolutely the key thing that mm. British, you know, Pakistanis and Kashmiris and others would, would want putting on the agenda. I think it was actually, they even did arms deals while they were out there. Um, you know, it's, it's not really yeah. controversial that's not new but that's problematic from this of point course. of view so but yeah india, india won't respond and, and so given the current situation given the so we, we no longer have um this kind of romantic ideal of india i, I don't think we do actually in terms of that kind of you know the, the mm -hmm. peace loving sandal wearing kind of hippies um G perception india. of india the gandhi's india um the rhetoric mm -hmm. has certainly moved on and i and i do and i do think that there is an understanding that there's a shift in kind of political climate um you know yep, with 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 narinda modi yeah. and his government yep. however However, regardless, and we and I and I don't think 
um, and people are welcome to pick me up on it. Actually, I should give people a telephone number if you want to contribute. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's what we're going to say. 01582 and uh, text or WhatsApp on 0779 But um, certainly, you know, I don't have any qualms in calling it a far-right government. Um, this, is, this is the man, Modiwa, who was actually barred from coming to, 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 to serve. He denied visa right, yeah. when he was, uh, and he's now courted sort of internationally. But I, I guess that's another point. We do, we do have Mozammil uh, Ayub Takor, who was, who was on the, the line as well. He's the president uh, of World Kashmir Freedom Movement, linked to the resistance leadership and freedom, freedom movement inside the Indian occupied Kashmir, the executive di- director of, of the Justice Foundation. I want to welcome him as well. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Mozammil. Wa alaikum salam. Jazakallah uh, shukriya. Thank you very much for taking time out to speak to us today. So uh, uh, we're here in the studio. My name is Zafar, and I've got Rihanna uh, co-hosting today, and we've got Zafar Qureshi in the studio. So, so you, you, uh, are you related uh, to Doctor Yu Thakur by any chance? I am his son. Oh, mashallah, mashallah. So the, the the leadership continues, mashallah. Very good. Uh, so, so. Um, we, we, we're talking about the image of India and the fact that, that Kashmir is probably not getting enough traction um, because perhaps uh, of the, the significance of India in the, in the world political and diplomatic stage. Uh, what has your organization or, or the organizations you're linked to uh, been doing to sort of project the voices of, the, of Kashmir uh, and, and tell a different narrative of India? I think it's very important that we first note that um, until recently, the image of India, the economics, and I think somebody mentioned that the Gandhi, the Gandhi type and the flip-flop type of India, yeah. um, that's gone. Um, until very recently, everybody was very hunky-dory with India. It is because of their annexation of Kashmir that suddenly the tides have turned. We've seen the international media that usually never even focuses on Kashmir, never focuses on the human rights violations, even though they may have touched upon Palestine or Syria or even the Rohingya. Um, the crimes that have been committed in Kashmir are amounts of war crimes, crimes against humanity, genocide and even ethnic cleansing. Now we're looking at demographic change. These things haven't really been picked up by the international media. It is only and only when the far-right government's mouthpieces and the Indian media started criticizing the BBC, BBC's reportage of what happened in Sora, a place in Srinagar, where there was live firing and they had recorded this on camera. It is only because of that incident that uh, uh, the rest of the international media and the government uh, clamped down, well, not clamped down, but they kind of uh, uh, raised the issue of Kashmir even further. It is. It was a shot in the foot, let's put it that way. It was a shot in the foot by India for negating the actual reporting from independent sources. Since then, um, there has been Pakistan that have been one of the greatest advocates of Kashmir uh, over the last 70 years, but there's also been the indigenous Kashmiris on both sides of the ceasefire line, be they Azad Kashmiris or Indian occupied Kashmiris, along with general Pakistanis that have been active all around the world. This is not specific to the UK anymore. Before, we've always considered the United Kingdom to be the hub of activism for all types of revolutions. But this time it has been it has spread across the world. I've seen so many different countries where they have so many different um, uh, Kashmiris and Pakistanis and even the non-Asian population have started to jump on board. We've seen Turkey, masses of uh, people coming out protesting in favor of Kashmir, even in Malaysia. So the activism is there. Further to that, there is the fact that Pakistan took the issue to the Security Council recently, although it was a closed-door affair and it was very informal. However, it, after nearly, uh, I guess, 50 years um, that uh, the issue was raised again in the Security Council. Now we have in September the general, um, uh, the, the Human Rights Council, sorry, is also starting. Uh, inshallah, there are different organizations, including um, indi- in- indigenous occupied Kashmiris that are going there to present papers and to present the cause of Kashmir, the case, um, and even lobby uh, at the highest level to make sure that the issue of Kashmir is not going to be put on the back burner once again. Well, okay, if I can bring Zafar Qureshi in. Uh, uh, so the, the case is there to be made. Uh, there are potentially many, many, many supporters, uh, in, you know, from Azad Kashmir and uh, from the Indian side of the Kash- Kashmir. Uh, it's been 70 years. What's been going on? Why, why hasn't this voice been raised in the past and, and why has it not been effective? Um, <clears throat> as you had earlier, unfortunately, I, th- I think one of the challenges we have always have had is lack of a narrative and lack of the people from the indigenous community representing that cause. Mm. Yes, it's been there in the United Nations for the last 70 years, uh, but I don't think there's been enough uh, done on the international political level to actually move this forward. Mm-hmm. Um, 
we as an occupied territory uh, by the Indian forces, we don't actually have a direct say in the United Nations. So our lawyer, our guardian and the stakeholder is Pakistan. That's always tried its best. But I think we've lacked that international diplomatic uh, push uh, in but, the United but I, Nations. But I, sure, sure, I know for sure at the local level, uh, the, the political level in the UK at least anyway, many many of the MPs and, and councillors hail from, from Azad Kashmir and many of them have raised their voices within Kashmir but they've fallen on deaf ears. Uh, what, what, what can be done differently I guess now uh, to make sure that those voices are taken seriously? <clears throat> I think one of the things uh, that definitely will help in terms of moving this forward is having a consistent policy uh, by Pakistan on the Kashmir. Yeah, we having uh, we see a consistent policy from India on Kashmir, where they just don't want to talk or negotiate on Kashmir. Whereas Pakistan's policy, in fact, you know, somebody was mentioning last uh, couple of weeks, they don't even have a policy. Mm. They need to that. I think it's a high time where they actually have a consistent policy that not only um, is highlighted on the international, but in, even in their domestic um, affairs, Kashmir policy has to be the center focus. Right. They need to go everywhere. They need to raise the uh, voices of the people of Kashmir. There are, um, you know, there are many, many indigenous people out in the diaspora who can represent that cause, who can go out well. The Kashmir issue has always been seen from the perspective of either Pakistan and India, or it's been tainted as an Islamic terrorist issue by the Indian government. Mm. And I think we need to, unless we actually break that perspective, break that nar- uh, narrative, by making sure that the wider community, not just the Asian community, you're right, we've got about 520 politicians from Azad Kashmir and Pakistan in the UK. But I don't think we've actually been able to um, clear the narrative of Kashmir that it's not just about India or Pakistan. It is an issue of 14 million Kashmiris who've been denied their basic fundamental right for the last 70 years. Yeah? There are people of Kashmir uh, in diaspora who can stand up and make sure that they, uh, the world hears actually what's happening on the ground. Um, you know, you look at the Indian media at the moment, everything uh, that they paint in Kashmir is like, you get news from NDTV, from Republic TV saying, everything is okay in Kashmir. Mm. But when you look at the reality, like the reports of BBC or New York Times, you can see actually that's not what's happening on the ground. And these are some of the challenges that we have, and we need to start countering them. We, okay. need to, we, need, we need some activism. We need, uh, to, we, we need some activism. Uh, Mazamala and Sephora, actually, this is a, maybe a question for both of you, because uh, Mazamala, I hear your kind of renewed sense of positivity in terms of the way that people are now talking about this. And because of that shift in ideology in um, India, that it has hit the consciousness of more and more people. However, and I'll, I say this, actually, I, I'm not Kashmiri. I, I'm, I'm, I'm of Pakistani descent, but I'm also British. And I, and, I, and I refer to my Britishness because actually I, I think that there is a quite unique responsibility within this whole debate and a real, real unique position for, for Britain to step in because this is a mess of post-colonial making. Um, so whilst there is, and I hear it and I see it, a level of renewed kind of um, faith in terms of you know, actually more people are hearing about this. We are getting more independence in terms of its coverage. Are we hitting the political level that we need to? Certainly the response from our leading politicians, people like Don, Dominic Raab here in Britain itself, or, or, or the Prime Minister, have been quite muted. Uh, is that a question specific? Well, it's, 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 it, you know, I'm, I'm full of statements and questions, so there, there's my view. Yeah, Mazama, come, <laughs> come in, Mazama, like, uh, so what, I can uh, add to it. Yes. How, how, do, do you think, do you, are you, are you, do you think the political response sort of nationally from the West in particular and Britain specifically has been good enough? In, in, in the current climate, as it stands, um, can, from, from the 5th of August, it is better than it has ever been in our probably history, I would like to say. Uh, we haven't had this kind of response in the past. We haven't had this kind of interest in the past. The fact that the security, I mean, it's very important that we recognize that nearly 50 years it took the Security Council to actually discuss Kashmir again. For, I mean, whether formally or informally, but it happened. Um, that's something that's very relevant. When it comes to uh, our own government in the United Kingdom, we have to remember there were 62 or 64 MPs that signed a letter uh, um, directed towards the Indian High Commission. We have the uh, uh, medical m- magazines that have been publishing articles 
in regards to the support uh, for the right of self-determination for the people of Kashmir, but more so in regards to the human rights abuses that have happened and condemning them. We've had various celebrities even and uh, politicians unrelated to Kashmir that have never really touched them and didn't even, probably didn't even know it. So it, it's a start. I agree that it is, it is very late. But it's never too little too late in, in, in when it comes to Kashmir, when it comes to politics. It's been going on for 72 years. It's highly unlikely that we're going to solve this in the next 72 years. But at least this is a start. Better late than never. Safura, what's, what's your view? Yeah, I would agree. Um, that definitely what we're seeing now is something that we haven't seen before at all. Um, for sure, I would like, uh, in an ideal world, I would like it to be more meaningful. What I've seen a lot of is, um, and, and I'm not criticising it, I'm glad it's there, what I've seen a lot of is um, people calling for um, the rights of Kashmiris, um, self-determination of Kashmiris, etc., etc. And all that's really important. But what I really want, and this is an opportunity for us, the people who, who are campaigning on this issue and care about this issue, the opportunity is there to basically further inform. Because what yeah. the issue is, self-determination has underpinned all of this from right from the beginning since partition. But what actually on a day-to-day -day level has been the challenge for the Kashmiris is yes, their desire to have um, some level of actual meaningful autonomy, but actually it, it's, it's the draconian laws that are in place, such as the Public Safety Act, such as the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which essentially has allowed the, the, the Indian military, who very, very densely militarised that area, to do quite literally whatever they want to do without any sort of accountability. It's, it's supposed to be an emergency law that's been in place in Kashmir for um, since at least the, the 80s. Um, and it's actually in place in other parts of India as well. The, um, for example, I think Manipur, which is the northeast state. And again, it's in place because India feels a level of threat from the kind of political, um, minority political sort of views there. So it, it's these sort of actual, the crux of the issue, like when people are talking about self-determination, the right of Kashmiris, Article um, 370, I want them, it to be meaningful. I want them to understand that on a day-to-day -day level, Kashmiris have been criminalized um, yeah. by this heavy military presence. They've been traumatized. You know, it, it's it's that the issue is that the, not just that they've Article 370, but that people have been living under these draconian, unacceptable, anti-human rights um, exactly. kind of legislation. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, it, yeah, it needs to change. Okay, so, so I just want to reach out to our listeners. I know that there's a large audience out there. Uh, probably wanted to sort of have a convers uh, joining the conversation. So, uh, listeners, if you want to call in and share your views, uh, the number is 01582481822. I'm going to open the lines now. 01582481822 if you want to ring in and, and share your views. Uh, alternatively, if you want to WhatsApp us or text us, 0779481822 if you want to text us to share your views, and I'll, I'll read them out if you, if you send them via WhatsApp. Uh, we do also have now with us, we're fortunate to have Atar Zia, is a, is a poet and a political anth anthropologist. Uh, he teaches at the University of Northern Co um, Colorado, uh, Greeley. Uh, welcome to Inspire FM, uh, Atar Saab. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you for having me. Um, at the cyber, maybe even. Uh, I do apologise. Yeah, uh, yeah the yes. cyber. <laughs> well, welcome indeed. Uh, I couldn't tell from the name. He's, got, he's gone quite red, so everyone. Well, I have gone quite, quite red quite, indeed. Quite a, uh, quite a significant um, apology. There. <laughs> indeed, yeah. Well, uh, the name is the name is confusing, so there's no there's no offence taken. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you indeed. Uh, so perhaps we were talking about the fact that uh, Kashmiri voices are beginning to be just heard now, 70 years on from from uh, the uh, the original decision that was taken uh, during partition. Uh, perhaps you have a view on that and, and, and wha what can be done to, to raise those voices further than they have been uh, and so far. So thank you very much for inviting me, and this is also a symbolic of how Kashmiri voices are being included in the discussions that are being had around Kashmir. So I do want to note that Kashmiri voices have been speaking for the last, not just 72 years from 1947 onwards, but right from 1931 and even before, because even before India and Pakistan became two dominions, became two countries, uh, Kashmiris were demanding a sovereign nation. Mm -hmm. So they have been speaking and they have been writing and they have been talking, but it's almost like no one heard them beyond the region that they were uh, cosseted in. So uh, so uh, it's not just that we are out now and we are talking and you know, there's, there's some level of uh, being listened to, but Kashmiri voices, and I want to kind of draw your attention to that legacy that we've had our forefathers and foremothers 
who have spoken, who have written about Kashmir and have constantly, constantly, uh, for every decade, for every new generation, uh, laid foundations of a new narrative, uh, talking about the same historical and cultural resistance that's been part and parcel of Kashmiri lives. So um, so this is, uh, this is kind of... Uh, just to lay a foundation of the fact that it's not as if Kashmiri voices were not speaking, it's a matter of where they being heard. Sure. So I think that's the level where we are right now. Uh, there is a certain readiness in the global community, there is a certain con- consciousness that's already evolved. I think we are ready to listen to Kashmiri voices and in the past two decades, uh, Kashmiris have also done some groundwork in academia and activism and journalism, trying to you know lay the plant plus foundations for those uh, those processes that will take uh, that that kind of are building up right now it's going to be a long haul uh, but uh, we do see we have um, you know in academia be it in US be it in UK or other parts of Europe and you know even other parts of the world uh, we see people we see our comrades our colleagues who are continuously you know spreading themselves thin trying to uh, make use of this moment mm. and this um, this moment for Kashmiris is very, very critical. It's not as if the siege is a new thing. It's not as if what they're undergoing right now, the level of trauma and collective punishment, it's nothing new to them. The communication blockade is slightly intense, but it's been happening to them on and off. So this part of uh, this, this time period for them is very, very crucial because right now a lot of things are coming together. And I think all of us Kashmiris, uh, whether they're inside Kashmir and they're not able to speak, and those outside who have prepared themselves for moments like this, we are trying to uh, you know, tell the world and consolidate the narrative that the Kashmiri voice, which has been speaking for the last 77 uh, years, and now uh, it's getting included in different places, which uh, you know, which are meaningful for the dialogue ahead. And I think that's something that uh, we all want to uh, note. We all want to emphasize. And I think, uh, you know, we are trying to consolidate that narrative and tell the world that there is a third voice, which is very pivotal, very crucial, and that's the Kashmiri voice. Sure. Okay. So I want to bring in Zafar Kashi if I can. So, so I guess some of this. Uh, again, we're going to go to a short break. Uh, if I can ask all of our guests to stay. On on the line for about five minutes. We're going to go to a short break shortly, uh, inshallah, and, and we'll come back and we'll carry on our discussion. It's really been fascinating so far. Uh, I want to talk about one aspect of, of this uh, this activism that we started talking about, which is mm-hmm. the marches. There have been a number of marches since the, f- the 5th. Uh, you know, perhaps you could talk about it and perhaps you could talk about whether they're effective or not and whether that's just a way of mobilizing people. Uh, I think marches in any revolution or any movement have been very, very effective in, sure. uh, you know, uh, garnering the support from the general public, especially in the United Kingdom, where the voices matter, where the public voices matter, where the, uh, you know, the political system actually listens to. I think they've been really effective. We've had uh, public support uh, that's been garnered from all uh, across the United Kingdom in Europe, where the people now have joined together to raise their voices. Of course, we still need to continue working in other streams, such as uh, you know the higher political level, the United Nations, with the NGOs, with the think tanks like Rusi and Chatham House. Uh, but yes, do I support the marches, bringing people together and raising the voices? I do. Right, we're going to take a short break, uh, uh, listeners. Uh, please do call in and share in our discussion. We've got some really, really talented people uh, from the Kashmiri sort of background uh, who have experience, personal and, and otherwise, direct experience, who can basically talk about it with a sense of authority. So stay tuned. Keep listening to it, inshallah. We'll be back after a short break. Asalaamu As Alaikum. This is Atif Nawaz, and you're listening to an Inspire FM podcast. Welcome back. You're listening to Inspire FM 105.1 FM. What an exciting show and what exciting and talented people we have on the, on the lineup today on the panel. And we have also been joined, uh, joined in the studio by another Zafar Sahib, Professor Zafar Khan Sahib. Assalamu alaikum ji. Wa alaikum assalam. Inshallah, we'll engage you shortly in, in a very sort of a meaningful discussion and debate about activities and activism that, that we're building up to, inshallah. Uh, we do want to continue the discussion. Uh, unfortunately, Atta Zia has dropped off a little bit, right? We're trying to get hold of her very shortly. But uh, perhaps if we... Oh, we, we, I think we've managed to get hold of uh, Atta Zia again, inshallah. Okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, 
Uh, Arthur, you still there? Arthur, you still there? Assalamu alaikum. Can you, hear, can you hear us? Apologies, there's a bit, a bit of a yeah. pause there. There uh, is. There yeah. is. Okay, Jazakallah Khair for uh, re rejoining us. Um, I was just speaking uh, in the break, actually. I was quite enthused to hear you speak about, um, you know, those, those, the existing voices, but also about emerging voices and more and more people writing and those messages out. For those of us who wanted to learn more, whether we're of Kashmiri descent or actually just people like me who, um, you know, who, who want to know <coughs> and understand this better from the Kashmiri perspective, who should we be reading? Who are those names that we should be looking out for? Well, there's many names, there's many writers. Uh, there are some writers who are traditionally have written for Kashmir and spoken for Kashmiris, are Kashmiris themselves. And uh, these are, uh, they, they also write in Urdu. Um, some of them are also writing in English. But uh, there are there's some novelists as well. Akhtar Mahideen comes to mind, uh, someone very important uh, who has written novels that are very, that manifest the uh, story of Kashmir. And then there are there is Professor Shokat Hussain who has written on uh, human rights. He's written on Kashmir history. Uh, there is there's also other professors who have written about Kashmir history. Some of them are no more. Professor Isaac comes to mind. Uh, and in the last one decade, uh, you have Kashmiri, uh, you know, uh, novelists and short story writers. Mirza Wahid is there. We have Basharat Peer's writing. Um, Shainaz, uh, Shainaz Bashir, uh, again a novelist. Uh, then there are academics who have written about Kashmir, and we have uh, a couple of organizations that are academic organizations, and there are websites that I can direct you to. And uh, the, some of the names, some important names that come to my mind are, there's Mona Bhan, who has written a couple of books on Kashmir. Then uh, Mohammed Janet comes to mind, Hafsa Kanjwal comes to mind. Uh, very recently, uh, there was a special issue done of the Economic and Political Weekly. It has several women scholars who have written on Kashmir. Uh, Natasha Kaul comes to my mind. So I don't know who I'm missing right now uh, at the spur of the moment, but there are people in the last one decade uh, who are in academia, who are journalists, and who are not just, you know, uh, for a Kashmiri writing, uh, whether it be sort of expression of uh, being a novelist or being a poet or being you know, just doing some art kind of stuff. Uh, Kashmiris put their art to the service of Kashmir because I think that's that's the prominent uh, motivation behind whatever we do. Uh, it's uh, if you're a poet, you do resistance poetry. If you're an academic and you are trying to research something, but you're actually using that research to uh, go back to your history and kind of revise that history and see it from a Kashmiri vantage. So there are several websites right now where you can, uh, which you can direct your audience. Do. And also there are uh, a couple of organizations that are working in diaspora which are trying to put these experts together, trying to put this literature together so that it gets out to the people. So, But these are some of the names that I named that uh, come to my mind who have worked in the last one decade and uh, they have put out work that is very, very meaningful. And then there are also scholars who are not Kashmiris but work on Kashmiri region and uh, there, there, there's some... Uh, Good, good resources that they have put out in the last. I've created for myself. Thank you. I've created for myself quite an extensive scribbling away as you were as you were speaking. I've created quite an extensive um, reading list for myself because I think one of the things that you know we've been talking around about here is elevating those Kashmiri voices and and and, and so on. Um, and kind of going back and and actually I think the point that you made about people kind of creating their activism and writing being part of activism um, is is, a, is an important one. Um, Zamal, if I could bring you back into the conversation, um, mm -hmm. we're pleased with the way that things are moving, but where do we need to go next? What, what are the next steps? Uh, obviously the situation we know in Kashmir now there's an imminent kind of fear and threat for Kashmiris at the moment. What do we need to do? Look, from the diaspora, it's very difficult to make any kind of influence on the ground, especially inside Kashmir. Um, as you mentioned, the, the, the situation there is very critical in terms of healthcare, in terms of education. I mean, everything is shut down. If you can imagine that three weeks, it's not even a holiday. People are stuck inside their homes. They're prisoners inside their own homes. One of the first things that we need to consider is um, allowing international aid agencies to go to Kashmir. Um, but for, further to that, I would strongly, strongly advise anybody, hopefully, that's listening right now that's working with the United Nations or any international aid agencies, that we need to fight 
uh, we need to send fact-finding missions. Now, there have been organizations and di various different governments that have offered to send independent fact-finding missions into Kashmir, and I think that we need to look beyond the Article 317 and 35A issue and ultimately get down to the crux of the issue, which is right of self-determination and also the human rights abuses. We want people to have uh, justice. The justice needs to be delivered to those people that have suffered under this occupation, this brutal occupation for the last 72 years. We're talking about pellet injuries, people being used as human shields, um, and the type of torture that I don't want to talk uh, at this yeah. time of day, um, uh, you know, various other, other words that I don't want to use, but let's just say that some of the worst forms of human rights abuses. So I think at this point in time, what needs to be done by the international community is to intervene before the situation escalates. You have to remember that you have Pakistan, you have India and UK power, and you also have China. China has interests in this region. The amount of investment that China has made into Pakistan, into Azad Kashmir, is phenomenal. They would never be interested in, in um, a full-scale war, or even a small war, because there, are, there is always a, uh, the, the chance that it could go nuclear. Bill Clinton said it best when he said that Kashmir was the, or is the nuclear flashpoint of Asia. So at the moment, it's, that, it's a matter of um, de-escalating the situation. But this isn't de-escalation de between India and Pakistan. This is something that is very important because the narrative has always been between India and Pakistan. Right now, there is no Pakistan. There is no entity called Pakistan that is inside Kashmir. Right now, it is a brutal force, a brutal occupation and subjugation uh, between the Indians that are enforcing their version of so-called democracy and humanity on the people of Kashmir without even asking them um, what they want. So at this point in time, we desperately need to um, ask India to step back from the situation. Dialogue hasn't worked. We've had an innumerable amount of uh, conversations that Pakistan and India have had. It is not a bilateral issue. Very rarely we've ever had the indigenous Kashmiris representing this. Okay. Uh... I'd like to make one small addition to what uh, Dr. Athazia said, that in all of these writers, she also very, um, uh, not, I won't say shy, but she's being very uh, humble in not mentioning her own name as well. So sure, indeed. Okay, Muzama Saab, thank you very much. We're just, uh, the last 20 minutes or so we've got left over. Your contribution has been really, really valuable. Thank you again. I'm sure we'll speak uh, at another occasion. Jazakallah have for, for today. Asalaamu Alaikum. Right. Okay, uh, if I can now bring in uh, Zafar Saab, same question to yourself, uh, Zafar Saab. What, what, what needs to be done? What can be done? Sure. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me uh, this evening, Zafar Saab. Uh, I'm uh, I'm actually uh, quite hopeful in, in terms of what can be done, particularly from the point of view of the uh, Kashmiri diaspora uh, and as well as also uh, in Pakistan. I mean, I I, I have some apprehension um, apprehensions about uh, the, the the sort of way that the Pakistani government has uh, reacted and articulated its arguments over over Kashmir and I think that is a uh, that is a that is a kind of a, I think it's a lament rather than a, a, you know a, a sort of a, a proactive type uh, yeah 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 because I, I, I think um, there are mixed messages coming from Pakistani government or various bits of Pakistani government or Pakistan state and I think that is where we need to have a more robust I, I think a, a message coming through and there are a number of uh, diplomatic uh, uh, di diplomatic uh, actions that uh, that are only possible uh, from Pakistan, and I, I mean I I, I hate to um, uh, disagree uh, with the Muzammal, but I, I think is is not right when he says that Pakistan is no longer in Kashmir. Pakistan is a party, and in fact, uh, Kashmiri leaders who are in jail now uh, and non-status quo leaders, anti-status status quo leaders, and uh, Yasin Malik, for example, I know he was approached uh, before all this uh, to dialogue with India and he yeah. said no I cannot dialogue with you because the dialogue means three parties you India uh, Kashmiris and Pakistan so therefore there is that dimension which I, I think okay. we must, so we I, must I think, I think yeah. we, we've got the political level of, yeah. of I think we need to talk about I guess grassroots level support that, that we need yeah. to do if I, if I can bring <coughs> Minas Shah in we managed to get hold of her she was due to speak uh, early on today but unfortunately she, she's been, been tied up we're grateful that she's <coughs> made some time to speak to us today uh, Assalamu alaikum Minas Shah you, you on the line? Yes, I am. Th thank you very much for joining us again today. Uh, you're always welcome on Inspire FM. Uh, I just wanted to ask, basically, you've obviously raised some voices in support of the Kashmiris, and in particular you wrote a letter regarding uh, uh, to the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi for giving this award to Modi, who's, who's seen in a different light, I guess, in that part of the world. Yes, um, I was very, very disheartened to see the UAE adorning Modi um, with any award, particularly particularly given what is happening in Kashmir. 
Um, so I think I, I was very disheartened about it, and I had to raise my voice against it, and in you know in, in the best possible way, which I know how. So I wrote to him, and I expressed my concern. I expressed how how I felt about it, um, and and it's not nice. It really, uh, have really you had a, have you had a response? I haven't as yet. Um, so yeah, well. If I do get a response, I'll let people know. So, so I, I guess, Nasir, what, what else have you been doing? Because you, you're a par parliamentarian, uh, you, your voice is uh, prominent uh, um, among the corridors of power of this country. What else have you been doing uh, to, I guess, to raise the voices of uh, of the Kashmiris? So, so I'm a member of the all-party parliamentary group on Kashmir. And in the last couple of years, in the last few years, I've been in parliament for four years now. There have been some steps which haven't happened in the UK previously. Um, so, for example, certainly in our uh, 2017 manifesto, we, we, we have pledged as a party to deal with the issue of Kashmir, which is the first time a, a leader has done that, which is, which is far from what the current situation is, where Boris Johnson has abdicated his responsibility, despite the fact that the, the British have a huge, um, you know, huge responsibility in that region, because what we are dealing with now is the leftover after uh, the Raj ended. So I think it's really, really important that we don't see this as a issue between two countries and we see it for what it is, which is the absolute violation of human rights, um, you know, the denial of sense of self-determination as promised to the people of Kashmir, uh, of occupied Kashmir, and the breaches of international law, because what we don't want is a, another Palestine and we certainly don't want another Srebrenica. And the way it's happening, it's nothing more or short, short of uh, ethnic cleansing is what I see him doing. Um, now, Salaam alaikum, it's Rihanna Faisal. I'm co-hosting today with um, Zafar. Um, I wanted to ask a, a question. I think one of our earlier speakers, uh, I think it was um, Mazammal from the World Kashmiri Freedom Movement, said that he felt quite buoyed by the reaction this time um, about the international response and that it was kind of unprecedented in the way he feels um, in terms of the way that we responded and the condemnation that um, was kind of levied at India. As somebody uh, who, who walks the metaphorical corridors of power, do you feel that? Do you feel that the story of Kashmir, the plight of the Kashmiri people, is it hitting those places that it needs to hit for us to get some real traction, some real action on the issue? I, I, clearly not, because had it been hitting the right nerves and the right places, it would have. We would have had much more in terms of um, the British government stepping up and taking, you know, showing that leadership and not abdicating yeah. their responsibilities. So unfortunately. Yes, whilst um, the issue of Kashmir is very live, the issue of Kashmir is very much out there. Uh, some of it is largely, you know, down to social media following the blackout, and people are managing to find ways of expressing what's happening there. The truth is, it's not hitting the right nerves because there, there is, you know, we've got uh, some of the, some parts of the world celebrating uh, a man who has just, you know, rubbished an article which gave protection to rights to, rights to people. And, you know, is that, you know, this is, this is a guy who was barred from the USA and the United Kingdom at one point from being, you know, had a, a name of Butcher of Gujarat. We're not talking about, you know, just, um, no, we're, not, we're, we're talking we're, yeah. about who, somebody who was absolutely systematically, um, you know, butchering Muslims and played a part in that. And now we have him going into Kashmir with a lockdown of how many days now? It's disgraceful. And I, We'd never tolerate that anywhere else. I think one of the things that I have spoken about quite consistently in this is, is the role of Islamophobia in this whole thing, in the support for what um, mm -hmm. India has done, but actually also in the way that Kashmiri voices have not have been marginalised in the way that the Kashmiri people are often presented. And I've, I've heard sort of, you know, um, testimony after testimony, people talking about Kashmiris, particularly from the uh, fr from India, using words and language that are really quite um, defamatory. Um, the kind of language, actually, I think we are probably quite used to actually as British Muslims, unfortunately, you know, links to terrorism, all of those kind of things. Um, but I think there is a relationship between what's happened um, and the global rise in Islamophobia. Um, would you agree with that? I think there is an absolute undertone of anti-Muslim narrative and Islamophobia out there. Of course there is. It's undeniable. It's the far right, the rise of the far right. You know, you've got to remember Modi was, you know, before yeah. Trump came along, Modi was Trump long before. The only reason Trump got the kind of uh, 
confess that he did it because he was the so-called leader of a free world. Yeah. You know, the, the, but Modi was there a long, long time ago with his nationalistic agenda, and he wants to, you know, he refers to India as Hindustan, and he wants it to be Hindustan, where there is no space for any other, um, you know, any of a secular democracy whatsoever. And he makes no apologies for that. And we've seen the rise in violence and the persecution of minorities, including Christians and Sikhs. You know, the um, so so the, the, and and as far as the, the the Muslim thing goes, in terms of um, you know the cleansing of Muslims, and we always we we continue to hear this. And I've, I'm I'm sick of hearing, you know, it's Pakistan uh, terrorism, 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 mm -hmm. well, because nobody's actually saying occupation, 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 right. illegal, illegal, illegal. That's what we need to be hearing. You know, and, and, you know, mass rapes, the abuse of women. You know, rape is used as a weapon against the Kashmiri people. You know, pellet guns. People. You know, only last week I, um, you know, I've met with, during the protest in the last couple of days in the last few weeks. I've met people who've got family there who have returned from there. And even if it's a story of a, a guy lying down in the, you know, in in the middle of the night and getting shot just through infrared lenses just because he was lying on the bed. Lastly, Naz, I know I know you need to go, and I think I can hear some little voices in the background as well there. Um, but b before we go, Naz, I know you you you've said, and, and I think I think we can all agree with you, is that we we would like to see a better response from our government. Can you tell me, in, in your view, what does that response look like? What does Britain need to do? That response looks like Britain picking up the phone and bringing people around the table and having conversations and saying, you know, enough is enough. This is not what we agree to. This is not what the international community um, accepts and will condemn it. And right, so, so far I've not heard any, you know, condemnation. I haven't, you know, in the, in the terms that it needs to be. So the language, language needs to shift. The position needs to shift. And Britain needs to dig its head out of the sand and acknowledge that we have a responsibility to the people of Kashmir. And right. it's not a matter of internal for just India and Pakistan. Well, Tzaka had Naz Shah for your contribution. It's been really valuable. Uh, thank you very much for taking your time out today. Uh, we are going to carry on with that uh, basically thread uh, about activism and what, what can be done and raising the voices and making those voices effective. So I, I guess in that, that light, I think locally and I guess nationally as well, there have been some protests. These politicians aren't going to move unless there is groundswell support uh, at the grassroots level. So. Uh, Zafar Saab, do you want to talk us about what's been organised locally uh, uh, to actually sort of get get that pressure building up? I, I think perhaps uh, there, there is a local protest in in Luton, I understand. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Zafar Saab is part of it. So please do <laughs> encourage people to get there. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Nasha, yeah. So I'm gonna I, I, yeah. and and also in Bradford, where you're from, uh, Nasha, and and there was a good good robust pro uh, protest there as well. Now, I, I think uh, um, Zafar Qureshi can uh, speak about uh, what's happening in Luton, uh, uh, so can I. But uh, I think generally uh, responding to that, uh, I, I think there is an energy now within the Kashmiri diaspora right throughout the world uh, about this. And the reason for that is that what Modi did on 5th of August is completely try to obliterate um, at least two, three thousand year history of uh, Kashmir and certainly 173 years of history of the modern state of Jammu and Kashmir. And I, you know, it's locked down for 20, a whole 26 days. We don't know how the feelings there are. We have an idea. And, you know, we have yet to actually ascertain the reaction of the people. Uh, um, you know, 12 million people at least are under this curfew. Um, now, as far as uh, coming back to uh, um, the Britain, for example, you know, the demonstration on 15th of August outside the Indian High Commission, a tremendous turnout by uh, Kashmiri diaspora the, the, and their supporters, Pakistanis and so on. Now, it that had, yeah, right? yeah, and lots, lots of people from Luton as well. Uh, and that had an impact on India. Indians don't like, uh, the Indian government does not like uh, even 10 people outside its high commission in Britain or anywhere else because it's bad publicity for India. And India has a cuddly and woolly image that it wants to actually protect uh, throughout the world. Now, they, they came back to uh, the British Prime Minister and they complained. Why are you letting these Pakistanis demonstrate 
um, just because of their votes. So there is an, a, 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 there is a something in there about demonstration, and I think the demonstration which uh, nationally is being uh, planned for 3rd of uh, uh, September is going to be, uh, you know, if not uh, uh, bigger than the one on 15th of August, at least as big as that, and it will have an impact because you, you congregate in uh, Parliament, Parliament Square uh, and from there, then you move, uh, par march on to the Indian High Commission, and they won't like it. And I'm sure they will actually get at the British government. But last point about the British government and and, uh, and its policy, and Asha actually touched on that, and I agree with her that um, the reaction of the powerful countries has been uh, negligible. And in Britain, I, I know from experience that they simply sit on the fence. They say it's a, qu a question of uh, uh, India and Pakistan deciding. You know, a fifth of a fifth of August, after fifth of August, now th the whole goalposts have been um, have been changed by uh, Modi's ultra chauvinist and fascist BJP stroke RSS led government. And you know that is as bad as. They come, and you know, they, they they just match Hitler in that uh, that respect, and so British government actually sitting on the fence is not acceptable, and that we can change the the Pakistani Kashmiri diaspora and the the, the peace and loving anybody, anybody, anybody yeah. who's yeah. interested in justice, who's interested in democracy, who's interested in fair play, and who's interested in actually who has a, a care for human rights, uh, has to actually join in this 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 struggle and and put pressure on, on the British government and, and I'm sure uh, the more uh, of these activism um, by grassroots uh, uh, you know uh, Kashmiris of British uh, British Kashmiris of uh, people of Kashmiri origin or Pakistanis the, 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 the more effective it will be and I'm going to encourage people to do that. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, mashallah you know well eloquently put about the activism uh, that we need to do especially the demonstration that need is going to take place as well as uh, other demonstrations that are happening. Just wanted to focus on a couple of points, especially regarding the 5th of August. Uh, as a Kashmiri from the Indian occupied Kashmir, um, who's been involved in this struggle for quite a while, and I've got my whole family there. The issue is not about abrogation of Article 370 for us as Kashmiris. It is the right of self-determination, which has been going on for the last 70 years. The concern um, is the ramifications of this abrogation. Uh, genocide earlier, and Amunakshi said uh, genocide is a technical term. But in reality, um, the history is a witness. The genocide started back in 1947 when over 200,000 Muslims were massacred in Jammu. And it has been carrying on ever since. So yes, it may be a technical term, but the reality is it is happening in Kashmir. And this abrogation is just going to speed that up. There will be a slow genocide demographical mm. change that the fascist Nidawata government wants to do in Kashmir, right? They want to relocate the Kashmiris. Now is our chance to stand up outside, whether we are doing protests, demonstrations, or rallies, whether we're working with, um, you know, think tankers or United Nations or any other NGOs to make sure that narrative is clear, that people of Kashmir want right of self-determination, our human rights violations, um, uh, uh, you know, human rights violations are taking place day and night. Hundreds of violations are taking place, especially through these draconian laws like Armed Forces Special Powers Act and Public Safety Act. We uh, need to I'm going to have to yeah. move you on because I, I need to. I think we got the Safura still on the line. Okay. I need to get one last word from her. So we we are talking about the process and uh, protests and Nashal mentioned that protests are happening in Luton as well. You should know that they're happening in Luton. Uh, the the basically the the marches take place in London on Tuesday, third of September. Uh, coaches have been arranged uh, at the Luton Central Masjid, Masjid and Al Hira Islamic uh, Education Centre. Uh, the everyone needs to be in London for 12 p.m. in Parliament Square, inshallah. So remember that, 12 p.m. in Parliament just, just Square. Just to quickly add, I don't know if it's possible, but um, certainly there is a <coughs> apologies, a digital flyer going around. Most of our masajids have been involved, so if you want to book a place on one of those coaches, do get in touch with your local masajid. They should be able to direct you yeah. um, to booking a seat. And you uh, have the uh, details. Yeah. Uh, details. For just, just, like and just, just to reiterate, uh, as a Kashmir on that, so I really want to thank the whole diaspora, uh, both as a Kashmir Pakistan and the non-Asian uh, community for showing their support. So do join us on the 15th of, uh, so, or 3rd of September. Okay, all right. I'm going to have to apologize to Safura. Sorry, Safura, we've run out of time completely. Do apologize. Oh, uh, inshallah, we'll speak at some other day. Thank you. Quickly, quickly. 
Can I mention something really quickly? Yes. Really, really quickly. Uh, it's gonna the ad's gonna kick in, but go on quickly. Okay, um, so basically, I would encourage everyone, anyone to write to your MPs. Don't be yes. worried about history. Yeah. Don't think it's complex. Yeah, write yeah. to MP. They yeah. have to respond, and yeah. it will generate some traction. People are already doing that, but uh, uh, your your uh, actually exhortation is just welcome. Yeah. Thank you for listening to our podcast. We stream our daily broadcast on inspirefm.org. You'll find all our daily updates on our social media at InspireFM Luton.